Hey everyone, welcome to the HamptonRoads.net users group. Uh, I'm Kevin Griffin. I'm joined by my cohort, Drew. Drew, how are Good you? Good evening, everyone. We're glad you could join us. Uh, we took last month off because I was on a family vacation. Um, the first family vacation we have taken in a while. Uh, so I completely disconnected from work. Like no Slack, no email, no phone, none of that. And we went down to Universal Studios for a week and had a blast, rode a ton of rides. And we missed the hurricane by a week. So that was, or like two weeks. That was great. Um, so, but I'm glad to be back with you all. Uh, we have an amazing guest tonight, uh, Adam Linda. Uh, I've known Adam for, let's not I, say, I think Adam was one of the first folks I ever met, like when I started doing community stuff. Uh, up oh, wow. in Richmond, Virginia. And <laughs> yeah, so Adam and I go way back. 2005, uh, I, I think is probably pretty close. To yeah. that, I think I got started in 2007 because uh, okay. I right. had gotten laid off from a job and started a new job and realized I needed to do some community stuff then to network. Uh, oh. So I started doing Richmond.net um, back when that was a hopping user group caught up with uh kevin israel for a beer probably two weeks ago actually oh, i haven't seen yeah. him in forever it's been a while hanging out with those guys he's in I, I, I need to make the i'll make the trip up there one afternoon and we'll all just get together for beer and that sounds great we'll make that happen because that needs yeah. to happen there's a lot of guys up there i like to say hi to met up with justin um, just the other day too so i know i can get i know i can rope him in that's another name i haven't seen justin in in a very long time. Um, well, he's doing well too, man. Simple Thread is just going up gangbusters. It's a great company. Yeah. Uh, but it was on a whim. Uh, Adam, you sent me a message uh, telling me about this talk you had put together. You sh showed me a video. Um, and I was like, I totally want this for the user group. So Adam graciously said he'd come speak with us. Um, so I'm, we're glad you're here. And you know, I'm not going to beat around the bush any. Uh, Adam, I'm just going to give it over to you. And if anyone out in chat land has a question, uh, drop it in the chat. And Adam has stopping points where, where he'll ask for questions. And I'll make sure the questions get over to him. Uh, but with that, Adam, the floor is yours, sir. All right. So, hello, everyone. My name is Adam Wenda. Uh, I currently am a staff engineer leading API architecture for a company named Relativity. Uh, if you haven't heard of us, we're an international company with around 900 engineers developing products that lead the e-discovery market. Um, our clients tend to be law firms, legal service providers, large companies, government entities. The reason I share that context is because after I found myself in this large organization, I realized how my like personal interests, philosophy, psychology, sociology had combined with my engineering experience um, to allow me to be uh, more, more effective than I anticipated. Uh, so this presentation is my attempt to pass on the non-technical skills uh, that I found most helpful. Um, so this is the topics I plan to cover. Um, and for each of these, I'll describe some behaviors or some advice that have helped me be more effective than I was before I adopted them. Um, yet when I look at this list, it, it still feels incomplete. Um, these are like business areas or domains we are all going to interact with eventually. Um, and here I've used them to group together that advice, some behaviors um, that are in reality implementation details. And I think all of us know, all of us in the IT industry know that implementations change, especially over long timelines. So I figured we should iterate and try to talk about the principles that are the driving force behind the specific recommendations I'm about to make. And I encourage you um, to look at the specifics as my current iteration and attempt to live to implement uh, these principles in my professional life. I share them here because if, if you take anything from this talk, it should be the idea of driving action from clearly defined 
aspirational ideals. Um, your ideals may be a variation on these. It may be very similar, may be very different. Um, I hope you have your own list um, or feel free to crib from mine. Um, and as we get started, let's uh, keep this next quote in mind. No doubt all of you have seen either this quote or a variation of it before. I include it because the advice in this deck is an example of how I put those ideals into professional practice. And some of what I'm about to share was painfully paid for by me professionally. Um, the rest came from you know, my mentors, uh, trusted coworkers, philosophers, sociologists, psychologists, and a fair number of accomplished authors. Um, every day, I resiliently, authentically, already calling back to those values, attempt to be what follows, but I do not want any of what follows to come across as holier than thou, right? This is my best self, is what I've put into this deck. And on any given day, how well I live up to it may vary. But again, every day, resiliently, authentically, I attempt to be what follows. So we're gonna move into the section on growth. And I wanna start with a story. Um, I was in the sixth grade, sitting in a science class, listening to a lecture on the topic of evolution. Uh, the teacher had a religious bias on the subject and was particularly disparaging. Uh, being the cheeky little kid that I was, I decided to be a little defiant and proclaim, I want to be evolution. This got a laugh. The class laughed, my parents laughed. The funny thing too, was that even the teacher approved of what I'd said. And so that was a bunch of reinforcement causing me to kind of keep that idea. And slowly over time, it became a part of who I am. But as I've gotten older and I've leaned into the idea more, I have refined it. And now I prefer to say I'm a prototype. Uh, the theme here is that I do not want who I am today to constrain who I can be tomorrow. I also like this phrase because I want to communicate the idea that I am continuously, intentionally experimenting to find a better version of me and that it's okay for there to be a better version of me, right? I don't want to assume that I am, that I've peaked or that I am somehow already done with my growth. So I believe it's an important part of this deck to communicate because if I had just up and decided one day that I was going to adopt all of those rather intimidating principles, um, I would fail. I would have failed broadly. Um, so I encourage you that if you decide to try and emulate this pattern that I'm trying to communicate, if you start down this path, I hope you'll be patient with yourself, make small changes, track the outcomes, and as always, iterate, right? So that's why I feel this next item is so critical to start with if you do begin down this path, because change is hard. <laughs> Engineering is hard. I mean, we start out with someone's vague description of an idea, then with some rigorous methods, <laughs> we eventually define what that idea is. We refine it into some requirements that might be actionable. And then we go about manifesting the product of their imagination into our reality. And for me, somehow that feels almost mystical, but I know from experience, it is difficult and it is hard and it takes work and that work we can only reasonably hope to achieve when we are working well within our teams. And teams bring a whole different set of hard problems, which is why I really wanna focus your attention on this next question. What is your personal why? What motivated you to get into IT and to become an engineer? I mean, we deal with hard stuff every day from why won't this compile to how on earth did that database value get changed? I know I've dealt with that one, right? 
then layer on the whole cybersecurity angle where people are actively trying to tear down what you build. Yeah, that's a, that's a hard place to be. So for me, when I had to answer this question, I came up with two answers um, for my professional self. And, you know, in my private life, I have different whys, but professionally, these are my two. And the first one is that I will be shoulders. Yet for me personally, this means a lot um, for some complex reasons. Uh, I won't be able to have children or adopt, but that idea of contributing to the progress of humanity, that idea of like, I want to leave the world a little better than I found it is particularly potent and very meaningful. So when things get hard, I think about this and I think about this moment right here, this moment where I am in this presentation talking to you. And it is that ability to say, all right, I learned these things and they cost me time for sure. In some cases, they cost me some embarrassment or some pain, right? But I learned these things and I want to ensure I do as much as I can to pass that on to someone else. And that is one of the things that inspires me. The other one is this idea of let's build a fort. <laughs> and if you were here earlier when we were uh, getting started, you heard me tell uh, Kevin about a story from my neighborhood where, that he's familiar with. And the way this story goes is picture me, you know, somewhere between like eight and 10, roughly, uh, with an armful of lumber and some nails and hammer, a saw liberated from my father's garage and my father somewhat irate about the fact later on in the evening. Uh, but I rounded up my friends. Um, we found a tree and we decided we were going to build a fort. And we butchered the wood and we butchered the tree and we divvied up the tasks and we built something. And it was definitely a safety hazard and nothing like what we expected when we started. But it was that experience of getting together with some like-minded individuals and buckling down to put in some work, to put in some, put in some blood. There was some sweat, you know, a few fast thumbs. But at the end of it, aside from all the pain, we had done something together that we could touch and we could feel and which didn't exist before we got started. And that was inspiring to me. It was exciting to me. So when I find myself at work in a hard situation, or when I find myself staring down my journal, trying to figure out how I'm going to, how am I going to improve? How am I going to not let that bad thing happen again? Or how am I going to optimize the way I interact with people to ensure I'm doing a better job of respecting their needs and their concerns and understanding where they're coming from to drive the business goal through that conversation. This is one of the things I turn to. And it's probably the one I turn to the most because for me, it's that ability to become enthusiastic by just calling on that memory and bringing enthusiasm into difficult problems, especially bringing enthusiasm into difficult group problems is a, is a game changer. Like you know, the harder the problem is, try to bring that enthusiasm and see if you can't change the perspective of the people who are working on the problem with you so that you can get to that next breakthrough, get through the, the next hurdle, maybe get a different look at the problem and make progress. And it's very powerful for me. But I just heard me mention journaling, right? And I'd like to move to this next slide because I believe that growth requires this practice, professional growth particularly. Um, in our professional lives, we spend eight hours at work. And whether I was a, a, a junior systems engineer at the education department in Old Dominion uh, back in 19, no, that would have been 2000, 2001. Yeah, 2000 is when I would have started there. Um, I started this practice then, and I had this little book and it was a joke that I called it the Tome of Infinite Knowledge and Wisdom because obviously at that particular point in my life, I knew almost nothing about information technology. Um, but again, it was a funny joke. And so I kept using it and I would keep a journal in there and I would say, all right, date and time, what am I doing? How am I making progress? Where did I get stuck? And it began 
as a coping mechanism for not being able to remember the thing that I wanted to remember, but it ended up evolving over time into something that really drove my professional growth. And you can see here, I've added some books to this slide. Um, I wanna call these out uh, because they are specifically dealing with change and difficult change and obstructions that are gonna impede your progress. And I think all three of them are a great place to start. I particularly like the audiobook version of Tiny Habits because it's read by the author. And if you're familiar with the book, you'll understand why that's significant. Um, so I encourage you to check these out. And I will be posting a link, uh, or I will be posting to my uh, LinkedIn a list of resources of the books you see here, as well as the ones that just wouldn't quite fit on the slides, but are also important and relevant from my perspective. Um, so to go through these bullets, notes are not a journal. Any one of us starting a new project will walk in, we'll take notes because we know when we get back to our desks, we need to remember what was said. But those notes aren't focused around how I am going to be able to reflect on them and how I'm going to be able to improve on them. Um, and it's really that practice of reflection, that second bullet point, that is the true value you get out of a journal. Um, and in order to even fill it out, you have to stop and think through, what did I do? Why was it important? How did it matter? And hopefully, what could I have done better? How could, have, how could I change in order to get to a better outcome next time? So that's super powerful. That is ultimately where the majority of the content in this presentation comes from, is from my journaling, my practice of reflection. But it has some really, really practical, just run of the mill daily benefits, like point in time credibility. Uh, I came back from vacation a few weeks ago, walk into my status meeting with my boss and we're talking about a bunch of different stuff. And then he asked me about the thing that I haven't even thought about in like 12 days. <laughs> and Fortunately for me, I have evolved from a paper journal. Um, I started off uh, with just that spiral bound notebook and eventually moved to moleskins. And then after that, I eventually switched to using digital uh, note taking devices so that I would be able to search them. So in this case, I ran a search and highly recommend anyone here who wants to take notes, wants to adopt this habit of journaling, Obsidian.md is a fantastic tool. It's a free tool, not sponsored or, or yeah, hashtag not sponsored, whatever. There, there's no none of that involved in this. Um, that tool is uh, the one I've adopted most recently because again, constant iteration, trying out new things. And I've moved from like Apple Notes to OneNote to uh, tried out Rome Research and now I'm using Obsidian.md. And each of them has had has taught me different ways of thinking about problems, but this, this later idea, this concept of smart notes, where it's essentially a graph database for your notes, that's good stuff, man. That's good stuff, highly recommend it. Um, but that point in time credibility came because I was able to drop in a search query, find the relevant information, give it to my boss. And that was great. I thought, I thought that was perfect. Uh, I liked it and he was happy with it. And so when you're in a new organization, one of the challenges you have is the need to establish credibility within that organization for people to be able to trust you. And that um, establishing that is greatly aided through use of a professional journal where you have, okay, it's Monday, it's 8 a.m. I'm writing down the things I'm gonna do today. And at every point in the day, I can tell you what I was working on. That's super helpful. Also, when I was assigned time to go research a subject, right? So back in 2019, uh, the company I was working with at the time was considering uh, adopting Elasticsearch. So they gave me like three days to basically go research and learn everything I could about Elasticsearch. And so as I'm sitting there learning and watching some videos, I'm, I'm taking notes, I'm, I'm capturing that information. And so in my Apple notes, I still have uh, like a couple hundred words on different aspects of Elasticsearch, where, where I saw its strengths, where I saw its weakness, links to resources that I thought were relevant to our use case. So that left me with an artifact that I have and I can then go back and reference, right? And if I need to look up on that subject or one of a, I don't know, probably 30 or 50 other subjects, 
um, over time, there's a, there's a notebook that I can go look in and I can go find that information. I can refresh my memory. And again, I find that to be super useful, super powerful. The last reason I'm going to put down for why I think you should adopt this practice is that sooner or later, we all have to update a resume. Uh, we have to walk into an interview or we have to perform some knowledge transfer, right? And in all three cases, my journal has been incredibly helpful. So if you are not already using smart notes um, or some form of like bullet journal is another one that's popular, go ahead and drop those terms into Google, go watch some uh, YouTube videos. And I think you'll come away with something very valuable. Does anyone want to discuss questions related to the growth portion of the deck? Uh, let's see. Chat is a little quiet. We have plenty of people out there watching, but no one's chatting. So keep going. All right. Moving on. So we were just talking about growth, right? And I have found one of the things that has driven my personal growth, uh, maybe not the most, but has definitely in, is definitely in the top three, is the idea of mentoring. That when I take time to try and pass on what I know, I'm forced to deal with the questions that that individual is going to have. And I try to always approach mentoring from this idea of bringing questions on how I can be helpful. That if I'm showing up with a syllabus, that makes me a teacher, not a mentor. A mentor, ideally, is someone who's outside of your reporting structure. So maybe they're on a different team or in a different vertical. Uh, ideally, someone who has seniority uh, you know, relative to you. So if you're just getting started, hopefully they've got three, five years of experience. And they can provide you with some reflection and some advice and some guidance when you're dealing with the problems that they dealt with. Um, and I really believe that when we go to establish these relationships, uh, it's on us as people who have acquired some experience to, to look for these opportunities, to, to hunt down our mentees, right? Go find them. Um, because this process will help you improve. It will make you better. But most importantly, it's how you can make other people more capable and give them the tools to succeed so that ideally, if we're doing this right, each generation of humanity comes along, we learn some things, and the next generation after that gets equipped with at least some of the things the last generation learned more or less for free because they were just willing to listen, right? Um, and so if we look back at like the progress we've made in IT, yeah, we've improved the, the tooling, right? But we've also imp improved our methods. Recently, I've been uh, reading Peopleware, which is a, a book on IT team leadership. And it was originally written in the 80s, and then it was they did a second revision, and last they did a revision in, in 2013. And it's interesting for me looking at that book and seeing how a lot of the issues that the book's talking about are directly related to like waterfall-based development. And all of us today generally approach waterfall design as something to be skeptical about. Um, but as I look into that book, I can see how things have evolved and things have changed. And so, you know, when we were taught Agile, we skipped the pain point of having to go through all the faults and failures that that book is specifically talking about, though there is a lot of other good content in that book aside from that section on that. So that's the goal with mentoring. You are going to improve yourself because you have to answer the questions. And when you have to stop and reflect and think and condense down that experience into one or two sentences that someone else can uh, identify with and adopt, it will help you improve. And most likely, you'll find that the act of mentoring helps you sustain the momentum to live those principles we talked about earlier. And maybe they're your principles, maybe they're similar to my principles, but whatever your principles are, when you go into that mentoring relationship and you're having that conversation, you are essentially trying to pass on, this will work, this won't work, I learned it because of this way. And you can't walk out of that conversation without having reinforced in your own mind that lesson, that principle, so that you're more likely to remember it at the right time and apply it at the right time. because. As I pointed out earlier, lots of us have an understanding of who we want to be. We have an understanding of how to, quote, do it right. But 
being mindful enough to be on point and get it perfect every time is really challenging, right? So I have found that mentoring is one of the ways that I refine who it is I want to be as an IT professional by the act of trying to pass it on. And then I come away with those thoughts freshly renewed in my head and more actionable in my day to day. So some down to brass tacks, how to find a mentee, right? If your organization does not already have a, a formal mentoring program, I encourage you to initiate one. Um, in my organization, we run two of them a year, uh, first half of the year, second half of the year. And essentially it's a survey that goes out that just asks, do you wanna be a mentee? If so, here's some questions. Do you wanna be a mentor? If so, here's some questions. And then one of our uh, volunteers will take that information, bring it together and identify good matches, right? So like frequently the questions will be, uh, do you wanna learn about testing? Or do you wanna learn about architecture? Or do you wanna learn about like managing and running meetings, right? And it's scoped broadly. It's scoped to say whether you are looking to transition from senior engineer to managing a team, or you're looking to transition from you know, intermediate inter engineer to senior engineer, there's a, a way for you to fill out that survey to indicate where your interests are. And there's a way for the mentor to fill out where their expertise is, right? So then it's a matching problem on the other side of that. So that's one really good way. And the other is user groups, user groups, user groups. I, I cannot emphasize enough how potent user groups are for building not only your professional skills, but your professional network. And I can tell you without question, the, the people like Kevin, um, who's running this one and you know others from other other groups I've been a member of, I can't tell you how valuable those relationships have been to me throughout my career to be able to say, oh yeah, I once watched this and give a talk on that subject. I wonder if they've got their notes handy or something, that kind of thing. Um, and so that's an excellent way to benefit yourself professionally and open up opportunity, but it's also an excellent place to find people to mentor um, because they have already self-selected in you are already talking about an audience of people who are willing to put in personal time to build their professional development. And I feel that that is the number one qualification. If you're considering whether or not it's, whether or not it's worth the opportunity cost to take the time and invest it in that person, their level of interest, how committed they are, how interested they are, should be your number one consideration. Because I have had relationships in the past um, when I was working for an organization, had a habit of hiring like junior and intermediate level engineers, where I was attempting to mentor someone who was essentially not interested, right? But I needed them to learn some things in order for us to move forward. And it was a, it was a contentious, right? It was fractious. And I, and I encourage you to look in those two places. Look inside your organization where you are currently. Look inside um, user groups. And odds are high, you can find someone who could benefit from the experience you've had. All right, how to conduct mentoring. That's the next challenge, right? First, you guys will notice I started throwing up some books. There will be a couple, book, a couple books on some of the slides. I actually have a really long list of books, but I didn't want it to get too distracting. So I will be posting all of the books uh, that I recommend. It's along with the podcast and, um, some other, other resources like the, uh, the, the note-taking tool I talked about. I'll be posting all that to my LinkedIn. And at the end of the deck, there'll be a, a, a way to get, you'll be able to find me on LinkedIn. So when you're running a mentoring session, and this was the very first mistake I made, I walked in having come from an authoritarian family growing up, very used to like an imperative form of communication. You will, you won't, that kind of thing. Um, and I came in and I tried, I tried doing that uh, with my first mentee, and it wasn't effective. Um, they actually will even say today that it was, you know, I learned a lot from you. And I'm like, yeah, I know, but I, I can communicate a whole lot better now than I did then. So the first thing I want to call out is make it a point to ask what it is that they want to learn, speak to what it is they want to learn, and at all points, try to empathize with where they're at. Again, go back to that list of values, right? bring it into the conversation, understand where they're coming from, understand what their career goals are, and ensure that you are aligning the advice in ways that will give them practical things they can do to make progress, right? 
The next thing is that these relationships can sometimes be a little uncomfortable. They can sometimes be a little awkward, right? You walk in and you're like, hi, I'm here to teach you something. Um, and I try to get over that by framing the interaction around a mutual love of discovery, of curiosity, of just understanding why and how things work. Because that's a thing you can more or less count on when you're talking to an engineer. We generally want to know how or why things work, right? And so one of the things I like to do is start to understand their background, understand what their hobbies are, and ask them. And like, take, I've never heard about that topic. Could teach me something about that topic, right? Or, or what can you tell me about that? Because one of the things that does is it changes the power dynamic to where your friends having a conversation, but one of you happens to be a subject matter expert in a given domain, right? And that's a different kind of relationship versus I am here to be your mentor, right? The next thing is make time for the interaction, right? If you are going to have to drop out halfway through or if you are in some way going to be rushing through that content, I encourage you to just reschedule it, do it another time. Um, there's no way you rush through a mentoring opportunity and leave that individual convinced that you're invested in their best interest, that you really want to see what is best for them. Because clearly, you have somewhere else to be, right? So make time for it. Um, and if your organization is supportive of this, especially if you're doing an in-house mentoring program, maybe even allocate like workday hours for it, right? So like I get to take a certain amount of time each week that I'm allowed to put into mentoring. And man, that just feels like such a privilege to me. It makes me very excited. And it actually is a retention benefit for the company, for me individually, because it's one of the things that inspires me to be excited to go to work is I know I'm going to have that opportunity to work with other engineers and to help them uh, bypass the mistakes that I've made. Um, what to talk about when you're in a mentoring session, right? So I've called out the Socratic method here, which I think is something that a lot of you've probably heard about. It's that idea of exploring a topic or teaching through questions, right? So when I'm in this situation and I'm working with a mentee, I'll ask them, so what are you working on? What are you trying to solve? And I will ask questions about that with those questions aimed at getting them to think about that subject the way I, as a more senior engineer, would think about it. And often, they'll surprise me. Often, they'll come back and give me exactly the answer that I would have given. So I wanted to call that out as a way to make progress or a way to, to add value, um, is that teaching through questions. And then the next thing that I find is super important or super helpful is that if they don't have questions for me, if they don't have something they want to talk about, I'll go grab a leak code problem. I will, we will sit down with a leak code problem and attempt to solve it without looking at the answer, right? Or let them attempt to solve it without knowing the answer. Obviously, like usually the senior engineers have some experience or some familiarity, but maybe it's one you don't even know. But that attempt to sit down and solve it from first principles is a great way to build that algorithm analysis reflex, right? That ability to take requirements and convert them into code and bounds check that code to make sure it's covering for all the edge cases. Um, next, the other thing I, this is another thing I try to communicate, and you'll even note curiosity. It's one of my values. It's one of my principles. It's one of the things that guides me. Is I try to communicate that idea of meeting adversity with curiosity, right? If it's not working, let's get curious. Let's not get frustrated. Let's let's find out why it's not working, right? That's just a puzzle to solve. And framing adversity in that context, especially early in someone's career, can actually have a, a really big difference. And like one of the things I, I try to push back on are things like cynicism and sarcasm, right? Because sarcasm and cynicism are ultimately like, you know, one is it's funny, but I can still do something about it. And the other is apathy about the problem. But those have roots in frustration, right? And ideally, I would like to help people see the frustration and then be able to make the conscious choice that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change my perspective on that frustration. I'm going to choose to be curious about the reasons that this is not working or it's not happening. So that's super helpful. And again, especially early in the career, when just about everything you try is difficult, right? Um, 
the next tip that I try to pass on uh, is mindfulness. And for those of you who are already familiar with mindfulness meditation, um, I encourage you uh, to, to make a point of sharing that wisdom with other people, um, especially your mentees. If you're not familiar with it, if it's a new concept to you, the best way I can describe it is the ability to distinguish between the information you are receiving through your senses, the emotional response we all have to just about everything that our brains perceive, and then the conscious choice on how you're going to act based off that information and the way you're feeling. And it's uh, commonly referred to as like standing behind the waterfall where you can watch life happen but the fact that life is happening does not immediately necessitate, necessitate you to make a specific response. You get to choose the response. So the next item up there is the importance of seed telling. And this is something that I, I found out about a phrase I learned about uh, when I was trying to learn how to drive cars very fast on racetracks, which is a very dangerous thing to do. Um, but when I was going through that, this idea of seed time is how the instructor would explain the difference between the intellectual understanding of what needs to happen and the instinctive response to make the right decision at the right time. And so ultimately, what he, I think what he's talking about there is, is pattern recognition, right? That, that's what we do every day. We see a problem and we're like, I know the design pattern for that, right? And so that gives you the ability to move quickly through a complex problem. And a lot of times what we are trying to convey to our mentees is the pattern, the way to think about the problem so that they get that same efficiency, so that they can move quickly through that problem as well. And also, they will, sooner or later when you're teaching them something, come back and be like, oh, man, you shouldn't have to tell me this again. You've already told me this like three times. Why am I forgetting it? Again, it's okay. It's okay, just you know, bring, the, bring that compassion, bring the empathy, right? You have been there. You remember what it was like when you were figuring this stuff out. So excellent opportunity to exercise your values and by exercising your values, pass those values on to other people. Because without question, teaching values is not a textbook opportunity, right? Teaching values is something best done by being able to emulate someone who, has, who is living those values. And then the last bullet point up there <laughs> is my own personal hill that I'm willing to die on, which is, for the love of God, put the mouse down and learn your keyboard shortcuts. So that's just my particular uh, hobby horse, I guess. Questions? All right. Does this feel familiar? Yep, sure does. All right. All right, we'll get out of the way. There were no questions, so you're good to okay. continue. All right, so moving on uh, from mentoring, let's talk a little bit about sponsorship. And the, there's a number of reasons why I think that this is important. And if you have read the staff engineer book, that's an excellent um, place to start with understanding how significant sponsorship is. Um, one of the cases that they talk about in there are you know very qualified senior like ready to lead an organization female engineers and the challenges they've faced in getting from like senior engineer to lead ha are kind of kind of incredible and a lot of times they even have to change organization before they get the opportunity to get interviewed for that next uh, or not just not necessarily interview but also be awarded that staff level job. So I wanted to call that out as a particular reason that sponsorship should matter. And then I wanna to add to the subject, the idea that as technologists, we have a duty, and I mean that word in the fullest, deepest sense, to bring as many diverse perspectives to the problems that we're solving as we reasonably can. The reason is for, and I think you guys may have heard about this before, but like faucets that don't turn on because they use um, a, a you know, laser or camera to detect when someone's hands on it. But everyone on the dev team was of a particular skin tone and no one else was there for the testing. And then you end up with what amounts to, you know, racist <laughs> fixtures in the bathroom. 
And that's that's not cool, right? And then we take it into the realm of software where, you know, I believe it was in California where they're trying to take bias out of decisions related to uh, sentencing uh, in the court, in the criminal court system. And so they trained a learning model to, to see if they could take out the bias, but the training data that they used was biased. And as a result, the model that they built was as biased as the system was before they tried to remove the human element from the decision making. And I believe that sponsorship is one of the number one ways we as software engineers, um, network engineers, just people in the IT community can help ensure we have the diversity of perspectives working on the problem so that we avoid these you know, serious consequences. Um, so for me personally, that means you know, actively seeking out mentees like we talked about earlier, right? Looking for mentees that will fill in those perspective gaps in my company and my team, looking for opportunities to help bring different voices into the architecture leadership group, right? And there are act, there are very real challenges around like supply chain and stuff like that. But if we choose to, we can find the people, right? If we make an effort at it, we can find the people and we can provide the mentoring. We can provide the sponsorship. We can bring these people into the organization, make the organization better and help improve the outcomes that our customers get from our products at the same time. So when it comes to finding sponsorship, opportunities, you know, it's not quite the same as what I described earlier. Um, I think that sponsorship is something you want to do a little bit more selectively. Like I will work with many, many mentees at the same time. Um, but generally speaking, I want to see the mentee reach a point of seniority in their current role, right? So if they're a, a, a beginner engineer, I want to see them master their tools, right? Do they understand the frameworks that they rely on to get their job done? Do they understand how to use their IDEs and their test suites? Do they, are, are they moving through that quickly and fluidly and easily? And if they are, then that's an excellent time for them to start looking at that next step up the rung or up the ladder. And as that level at that, you know, intermediate engineer level, you know, what I'm looking for there are people who have not just mastered the fundamental tools, they don't just understand their frameworks, they don't just understand how to get the job done. They're starting to expand their awareness. They understand the broad scope in which the solutions are going to live and operate. Um, they're starting to explore like side effects and like what are the what are the real world ramifications of choice A versus choice B? Because that shows they're starting to explore and demonstrate the judgment that we want to see in our senior engineers. And at that point, when I start to see them asking those questions and thinking about problems from the, this is more than just an engineering problem perspective, that's when I like to start focusing on how to help them transfer mental models, right? So can they, do, can they use diagrams? So in diagramming, I like to focus on three. Um, I think the, you know, the sequence diagram from UML, the state diagram, and the class diagram. And the reason is that that represents three different paradigms in our industry. One is procedural, one is functional, and one is object oriented. And being able to communicate effectively around those may or may not require the use of those diagrams. But ensuring they have the ability to look at a problem from a couple different perspectives, that's an excellent place for them to be. And so when I see a mentee reaching that point, okay, now it's ready. Now I'm ready for some sponsorship. I'm ready to start transitioning them to the like learning how to communicate the mental models. I'm going to take the time to teach them the C4 diagramming model, which is my preferred method for representing um, contextual information about a, a series of components or how a system is composed from smaller pieces. And so once they have that curiosity and understanding around like the non-engineering aspects, and they've got the ideas around you know, how to communicate or they're beginning to understand how to communicate mental models, I feel like that's the right time to say, okay, you are probably ready to start transitioning to senior engineer. And I would like to do that. I'd like to help that by seeing like, okay, there's some work I am, I have to do this week. Is there any part of that work that I can peel off and say, hey, either 
please like take an hour or two and replicate this or show me your show me how you would approach this problem so that that type of activity can be something they produced something they did something that i can then recommend that they include in a promotion packet right so they're starting to build a portfolio of evidence for what it is that they've accomplished and those portfolios those promotion packets and i know i'm starting with the last point but it really is the most important point up there is that those promotion packets are a leveling function on opportunity right it it is if you are following the google model right where the promotion packet has to be a database decision where i can compare a and compare b without anyone's name on it without even having a photo on it and i can understand who the right choice is from that promotion packet alone like that's an excellent way to ensure we're solving that diversity problem that i talked about earlier and sponsorship is a key way to ensure people get the opportunity to populate those packets with the types of meaningful work that are going to help them make that climb to the next layer. Um, so I also touched a little bit there on the delegate and give credit aspect, right? Because that idea of, can I peel a little bit off? So like at my level, staff engineer, that means you know a, a pretty complicated document usually, right? Or a complicated engineering problem or you know, facilitating a, a, t a tough engineering conversation. So that's a little bit harder to peel off. But for a senior engineer to peel off a little bit of work and say, either I'm going to do this and I want you to do it in parallel or to give them a shot at doing something that would normally have been reserved for a senior engineer, that's an excellent opportunity for you. So once you move farther up, right, so you are a senior engineer, maybe you're trying to transition to lead, maybe you're trying to transition to staff. In those instances, I believe the things we're looking for in people, the things we're expecting them to demonstrate uh, mastery of change a little bit, right? So to go from senior engineer to lead, in my mind, what that means is you have the ability to, to, to optimize the, the engineering approach to make mo best use of the system that already exists and the team that you have available to help you get it implemented, right? So some of the practices we have, like test-driven development, if you follow that practice, it has a tendency to create very modular code. Very modular code can easily be distributed amongst team members to modify and make contributions to. But if, like most of us, you have at least one of those legacy monolith systems around that, yeah, there's some tests, but we added them about five years after it was in production, those systems are much more challenging because then you're trying to figure out how you're going to batch changes to that system in such a way that you can get everybody working, get everybody making progress and still come out with a stable system on the other side of it. So it's that kind of strategic thinking about engineering problems that I see as the next transition point. And I believe that opportunities to, uh, to develop that skill, are, they're gonna be much more rare, right? But bringing a, se a senior engineer with me into an architecture design meeting is an opportunity for them not to just see that problem, but to see past that problem, right? Where we're not just trying to dissect a problem for the members of a team inside of a given solution. We're trying to dissect a much larger problem across many teams or even across verticals within an organization. Um, and so that opens an opportunity for them to look at and see how people who have been doing this for a while are thinking about it, talking about it. It's that bring a shadow idea on the, on the slide. And by doing that, what you do is you open the opportunity to then come back after it, right? So I got the opportunity to do this when I was a uh, you know, senior engineer. I got to shadow an architect. And you know, I would just go to the meeting and take notes. It's an excellent way to add value, right? So if, if you can encourage them to say, hey, come to this meeting, take notes on the meeting, and at the end of the meeting, share your notes. Names matter, right? The guy who took notes or the girl who took notes on the entire meeting and shared them out at the end, that's somebody you're gonna remember because that's really, really helpful. And it is hard to keep up with the notes through an entire meeting like that. And it's a skill that took me years to develop through my journaling habit, right? So now I can type pretty fast and I can keep up with a meeting more or less, uh, but having someone else there to help back me up or we're like maybe we're both taking notes in the same like shared word document or something like that, that's really helpful. And those notes can then become an artifact for that interaction with your shadow after the meeting, right? Set aside 15, 20 minutes. A ask them to explain some of the things that were talked about. Ask them to uh, share their perspective on how they would have tried to solve a given problem. 
And that is an effective way for them to start thinking about problems from a different perspective that a senior engineer usually doesn't have to worry about, right? And I also recognize that like a lot of people, and I, I actually work with a number of, of really talented senior engineers, one of which when I was like, hey man, like you're really great at this. Let me like come 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 to some meetings with me. I gotta get you, we gotta get you in on these higher level conversations. He was like, no, <laughs> just flat out told me no. And I'm like, okay, I can respect that. Like I understand, like not everybody wants to to transition up the ladder that way. Um, and so I think that that comes back to helping them understand their why, right? So we talked about that earlier. We talked about how if you're gonna start down this journey of trying to take these values and manifest these values into reality through choices you make, right? So you wanna improve yourself. You're gonna improve yourself by journaling. You're gonna improve yourself by passing on what you know because that forces you to reflect, that forces you to process it into a condensed form that will be both easy for them to remember and easier for you to remember and to retain and to live up to on a daily basis. So the, the other thing is um, when it comes to sponsorship, I try to be very sensitive around their career goals because just because someone is able to do it doesn't mean that they put the same priority on their professional life as I do. And I, I really can't stand that phrase, quiet quitting. I, I really take issue with it because from my perspective um, and the perspective of some another really great engineer I've worked with, in fact, he specifically said, hey, if you're gonna do a talk on this, you need to make sure you include this one point. And so this point is that we tend to have a stereotypical definition of what we think a top performing engineer looks like. Hey, they started coding before they even got to college. They had a Tandy computer or they had a whatever computer even going back farther. And this idea of like, they are so devoted to the craft that it consumes their being. Therefore, they are the one qualified to be an architect. I think it's a myth. I don't think it's true. I think that I have worked with incredibly effective engineers where software engineering or you know, IT in general wasn't even in their top 10 list of priorities. It was just the way they paid the bills. But they got their job done. They got their job done on time and they went home and they had their life and whatever that life was. And I feel that one of the things we should be conscious of as we talk about this very important topic of sponsorship is one, make sure we understand what their goals are and only if we're sure about their their reasons. Like if they've got a why, they know why they want to move up. Like for me, I want to go build a fort, right? I want to I want to be in those conversations where we're talking about what the fort's going to look like. I want to be engaged in that high level problem solving. And you know, I want to be shoulders. I want to go up there and get that experience so that I can bring the things I learn to other people, right? So for me, both of my wives motivate me to be the best staff engineer I can be and to learn as much as I can, as quickly as I can, so that I can share it with others. So let's be careful when we go down this problem of, uh, or when we, when we take on the problem of sponsorship to ensure we are only calling these people up after they have expressed an interest in it. Because I don't think that there could be anything more embarrassing than to say, oh yeah, so-and-so is really smart. He should do that project. And then they go ask so-and-so where he's like, I don't want to put in the overtime. No, thank you. Right? Like that's, that's, you know, that just puts pressure on them. So let's be conscientious about that. Um, yeah, I think that, yeah. So moving on, let's do questions uh, related to sponsorship, if there are any. Uh, there was, uh, that was a really good one. Um, can mentoring or sponsorship uh, take place outside of an organization? So uh, like out in the community, maybe you don't have an organization that that's uh, something that's possible. Absolutely. I did it last Saturday. <laughs> uh, I, I, the first time I gave this particular talk, I met a, I met two really awesome, energetic, just uh, like go get them type uh, engineers. And they were both just getting started. Uh, one had just completed a career transition. The other had just finished a uh, like a certification program. And, you know, I could just in talking with them, I, I, I didn't even get through the first, the first five minutes of the conversation before I knew one of them's why. 
Like they just flat out, this is why I quit my job. So I could learn the skills needed to go back and fix that problem in my original industry. And I was like, wow, you, you and I need to talk. I'm all about that. And so when I wiped my whiteboard clean for this talk earlier tonight, it was because it was covered in diagrams showing that individual how to get the most value uh, in the least amount of time out of Docker because they're at a point in their career where they don't need to be using Docker to design development environments or deployment environments, or they're not a DevOps, they're not to the point where DevOps is even something on their radar, but they need to know how to use Docker as a consumer, right? So that if they get handed a Docker Compose file, and I was just trying to get them to the point where like, well, this is what you need to know to know how to use it. And they're like, well, why does that work? Or how does that work? And I was like, all right, now I need to think this through. Okay, so this, 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 this. And so I was going through all these things. And what was interesting is I dusted off all that Docker knowledge that I hadn't had cause to use this year. I was using it a lot last year. Um, but in my current role, I'm not doing as much DevOps. So I hadn't made use of it. So like refreshed all that stuff for me. And they got that knowledge. And I think it was excellent. And because I was so impressed with that individual, and I, I actually told them, I said, you know, uh, I, I've mentored a lot of people. Um, and they all have varying levels of passion for the career development involved. And that individual has done all of the things like I wanted, I was like, all right, so we should probably talk about, you know, doing some leak code problems. She's like, well, I've already done 30 of them. And I'm like, what? <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. And so when I saw this person who didn't even have their first internship yet, but was throwing down on personal development, right? I was like, all right. I, I actually took the time to reach out to my professional network because I get hit and I'm sure Kevin gets hit. We get hit up with recruiters all the time. And I'm always polite. I always take the time to say, look, I appreciate the I'm inquiry, not. but I can't help at this moment for this reason. And so I usually get a reply back from them where they're appreciative because they're very accustomed to being treated poorly when people aren't interested in the job. And so I was able to go back to those people that I had treated well when I didn't have to treat them well. Again, finding every opportunity to personify my principles in my professional life, right? Mm -hmm. Go back to those individuals and I said, hey, I've found someone amazing. And this is the first time I've ever had cause to do that, but I did. And they should have an interview later this week. And I feel really excellent about that because that person's gonna go far and I'm gonna help them accelerate that journey so that they can get to the point where they're executing on their why where they're doing the change that they want to bring to the world and i find that to be very exciting so absolutely mentoring and sponsorship can happen anywhere anytime just have to be on the lookout totally agree so going back to an earlier point you made about user groups and community like just being active in that stuff helps tremendously just to okay. push that along um like, I don't think folks really understand the number of people who are regulars. I, I use quotes for that mm -hmm. because it is really easy to stand out if you just show up. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if you're in that space, you're looking for that sort of community, that mentorship, just show up, just show up. And like, people will notice like, Adam. It's good to see you again. It's all you exactly. last all you month before that. It's all you six months before that. Um, get to the point where people know your name. Like that's a really good position to be in because not most people are in that position. They show up because they feel like it, or are like, oh, I had nothing to do, or eh, I didn't like the topic, so I didn't come. Like, don't be that person. Just just show up all the time. Because the topic is only a sliver of the value, yeah. right? Because I've learned as much or more from catching up with people like Kevin, particularly, actually, and other individuals like him that were in the user group here in Richmond when I was coming up. Like we would, you know, we would sit and talk before, we'd sit and talk after. Sometimes we'd end up going out to a bar after to have an extended conversation. And I would learn as much or more just from that experience of being around other engineers with similar curiosities and passions as I would, as I got out of the talk itself. And at the same time, you know, it gives you that opportunity to establish meaningful relationships. And that's an important distinction, I think, because if you remember the 
values, the, the principles that I laid out earlier in the talk, the very first one up there was authenticity, right? That idea of, I legitimately am interested in remembering your name. I actually do care. And that care comes through. You, you like when you're living your values like that, it shows. And because it shows, it gives you that opportunity to establish these like high trust, high bandwidth relationships. And they are the most valuable thing you will have in your career. If you're very fortunate, you'll get the opportunity to build those types of relationships within your organization. And I feel very fortunate to work with a bunch of people who I believe I have that kind of high trust, high bandwidth conversation where because we've taken the time to build a friendship and to build a professional working relationship, I can pop in on them and be like, hey, critical thing, got to talk about X. And they're like, all right, you need Y, cool, got to go, no problem, and we're out the door. And, every, and nobody's offended, nobody's upset because we've already established that idea that I do care about you as a person because I actually do care about people. And I find that to be a really important part to make, or a really important distinction to make, especially as we move forward into our next section. Any other questions? All right. uh, no, not really questions. People talking about, well, you know, because of COVID, just a uh, user mm -hmm. group, a lot of user yeah. groups just died. And they did. So it's hard to find some of that outside community. Um, I think my go-to recommendation is if it's not there, go create it. Be the change um, you want to see in the world, right? Yeah. <laughs> it, and like meetup is not a cheap place to set up. Like they, they, they kind of have the market cornered, but set up a meetup group on whatever topic you want to talk about. And like, you don't have to have an expensive place to go, go to a bar or mm -hmm. a pub or a restaurant and just say, Hey, let's meet up. Let's talk shop and let's have a, have a meal or a couple of drinks. And you'll be amazed like how many people will show up for that. So I, I, I highly endorse that message. Um, <laughs> when I was, uh, working from home, I've, I've been working from home full time. This is my home office. I've been working from home full time since 2010. And so, I was working um, around 2012, I transitioned to working in a language for a startup where I was a partner in the company and the amount of hours I was putting in went through the roof and I had to change from the, the lovely deliciousness that is .NET to the rather thorny and uncomfortableness that I found PHP to be, um, which is not to say that it's universally perceived that way, it's just that it made, I had a hard time with that transition. Um, so one of the things I did is I just started a, a monthly meetup for beers or whatever your drink of choice is at uh, Capital Ale House. And, you know, we kept it going, I think, for a year and a half uh, before I had to step back from it uh, for other reasons. But it gave us the opportunity to just bring people into a room. And I even just we were just talking about a moment ago how attending a user's group is valuable for the talk but it's at least as valuable, if not more valuable, for the opportunity to sit and have a conversation with people before and after the talk. Because that's where someone's like, hey, have you, have you heard about this new framework? Or have you heard about this thing, right? And you're like, no, I haven't, or yes, I have. And that gives you the ability to um, identify things that should be on your radar that maybe weren't already, right? Just that learning through osmosis, so. Strongly, strongly support the idea that if there isn't one, start it, start it by just picking a bar yep. and picking a schedule, right, man? So. All righty, go ahead and move on, next section. All right, so I have a story because most of the things in this deck were bought and paid for with some tears or at least uh, some blushes. Um, once in 20, uh, 2018, actually, so, and this goes to show how long it took me to really grok this particular point. Um, in 2018, I was having a conversation. Um, it was a high level conversation with the board at the company where I was working. And the CEO cuts me off and says, you know, Adam, you've been talking for 15 minutes and I don't know what your point is. And that stung, man, <laughs> that, that went in the journal. Um, and 
it was um, uncomfortable, but that helped me remember it, helped me sit down to think about it and to decide what I was going to change to ensure that didn't happen. Because it's very easy as an engineer to think about problems from the bottom up, right? Because we're used to the implementation details being something that is constrained either by what already exists or what's even technically feasible. And so when we come to a conversation, I often see other engineers, and I know I did this a lot, I would start by saying, because of A, and because of B, and because of C, and around the time I got to X, I was ready to make a conclusion, right? And that's a little bit exaggerated, but the point being that walking someone through the same train of reasoning that we used to reach a conclusion is rarely the most effective way to transfer the information that is meaningful for the decision being made. If you're paired programming, perfect choice, right? Um, if you're having a heart to heart at the whiteboard with your tech lead, perfect choice. But when it comes down to, I'm trying to have a conversation with the product, the product owner, or I'm trying to have a conversation with a client or a customer, I really feel like the most important thing we can do is the first point on that slide. Optimize for brevity. In general terms, we're having conversations with other IT professionals, right? And you can usually assume with some safety that they are going to have some understanding about the context in which the decision is being made. So one of the things I'd like to do there is like, I want to try and get the most important thing I have to say out in the first 20 words and then finish hopefully with something to the effect of, and if how I came to that conclusion is not clear, I can talk about X, Y, and Z and just like give them a one word description, right? That way I'm inviting people to ask questions, but they're not obligated to listen to an explanation of things they already know. And I'm pretty sure most of us have been in a conversation and an IT context, listening to information we already know, which I think is really important because we're about to move on to another subject uh, once we get through this slide. And when we get to that subject, which is on the idea of business first, it's important to understand the reason why optimizing for brevity matters, especially if you're a consultant, double, it's doubly important in that context, uh, but also just as a full-time employee inside an organization, when we're having a meeting, even if, it's just a, even if it's just a conversation on Slack, right? If it's a conversation between two peers, the more time I'm putting into communicating the information, the less it's actually getting done with that information. And so I find that it is better to risk someone thinking I, I'm foolish or thinking that I didn't think it all the way through, which almost never happens, um, than to go in the other direction and inundate someone with detail so that by the time they get to the point, if they get to the point, they're exhausted by, how the, by the tour you took them on to get them there. Um, so I feel like that's a important, like one of the most important things we can do is that idea of like optimizing for brevity. And I have some suggestions on how to do that. Um, so avoiding metaphor, simile, and hyperbole, this is difficult. Um, I know like for me, and I mentioned earlier the story about me being a cheeky kid, you know, that bombastic style of communication of being able to say like something over the top, like, oh, if we do that, it'll set the servers on fire or trying to somehow convey the same point, but with like an artistic flair. Um, it doesn't add value to the conversation. It usually doesn't add clarity to the conversation. And I found that one of the things I can do is strip out unnecessary adjectives, unnecessary adverbs. Like the word very rarely adds a lot of value unless we're talking about how something changes, right? The V-E-R-Y. It, you know, we can communicate that through context. We can communicate that in a lot of other ways. So things like Elements of Style or Grammar Girl, which is a podcast, those are great resources where you can pick up additional uh, information on how to be concise, how to self-edit, how to like recognize variations in tone, for example. And I strongly encourage anyone who doesn't do this already to just before you send something. You know, go back, reread it, not just for spelling mistakes, not just for grammar, but read it for tone. 
right? That idea of like authentically wanting to build meaningful relationships with your peers means behaving in ways that are respectful, right? And not being demanding or impertinent, right? Trying to, trying to communicate what matters, do so concisely because you respect their time and you respect the, the money that the organization is paying for everyone involved in that conversation to have that conversation. Um, so another thing you can do uh, to help, especially in like a meeting context, is outline the bullet points you want, or outline with bullet points, the statements you want to make in the meeting. And, you know, I've, I've done this recently, actually, where like, I've raised my hand on Zoom, and I've just allowed the conversation to continue. And I'll continue to take notes, but down below all my notes, I'll just have like a few bullet points, like, oh, I want to ask about this, I want to ask about this, and I want to ask about this, right? And so I will listen to all that, I'll take down my notes, and often, one of the bullet points I was going to ask about gets answered anyway, so that one gets crossed off, um, which, again, optimizing for brevity, saving time in the meeting, being respectful of everyone there. Um, so that idea then um, leads into the opportunity to actually speak, right, where I can then, they recognize my hands up and say, okay, great, I've got four points, uh, you've already answered one of them, I'd like to go back and touch briefly on this, this, and this, right? And I can go through those points quickly and concisely. And because I jotted them down, I, I don't get in that thing that we do as engineers where it's like a rabbit trail and we branch and we branch and we branch. And about four branches later, we're like, oh, what were we talking about? <laughs> like, I've seen that happen so many times. And, you know, it is so easy because we are, by nature, worried about the details. And the details do actually matter but often we're communicating in a context where it's safe to assume they understand the details and that it's better to invite them to ask questions than to inundate them with explanation. So being able to hit those three points real quick and then maybe add that if you have questions or I'm thinking this generally because of this other topic, which we can go into if we need to, that kind of thing. I find that to be helpful. And if I've written my points out ahead of time, I don't stumble. I sound confident, I speak clearly, I'm not like, uh, and, mm, and or, or maybe, right? So I'm able to be concise. And, you know, again, that shows that you're invested in the meeting. It shows that you um, are trying to bring a professional quality to that conversation to optimize that conversation for efficiency. Um, so the next topic up here is alignment before persuasion. And this is something that I actually learned this year. And it has just completely changed how I deal with any kind of like contention between engineers or between verticals. Um, because it was it, through the purpose or through, the, um, through learning about that concept of like alignment that I started thinking about persuasion as a series of three alignments. And I wanna go through them in reverse because I think everyone is going to identify with the idea that we're trying to get on the same page about what the solution to a problem is. How are we going to move forward? How are we going to fix this, right? Everyone starts agreeing that that at least is the question we need to answer. But often, you can't answer that question until you're in agreement about what the problem is, right? I mean, I've, I've certainly seen cases where engineers are myself included, are debating about what the underlying problem is and maybe we should change this or maybe we should change this other thing or no, it's slow because of that, right? Um, so what I find is that agreeing on the problem is what's required before you can agree on the solution, right? So that's, a lot, that's the third alignment and the, the second alignment. But agreeing on what the problem is, I feel like that is where the, the interaction breaks down most often. And the reason I believe that is because I have seen so often in a conversation where someone has articulated a point and the counter to that point is something to the effect of you're not accounting for X or don't you know that Y? And so those types of situations are so common. I decided that when I'm in a situation where we're not agreeing on what the problem is, that I need to be the one who exercises, again, living those values, right? I'm going to go authentically spend the time, engage my curiosity, bring some enthusiasm, 
for understanding where it is and why it is that they are seeing something and reaching a different conclusion. Because we work with people who are, for the most part, rational actors, right? If they're reaching a conclusion, they have a process by which they got there. So that's the time to do that deep dive that I, I spoke of earlier, that we're generally trying to optimize that out. Well, the side effect of optimizing that out is you can find yourself in this situation I just described, but that's okay because we've got a strategy for that, right? We can work backwards. Are we aligned on a solution? Nope. All right. Are we aligned on the problem? Nope. Okay. Are we aligned on what the symptoms of the problem are and what they mean, <laughs> right? Um, because that's where I find that if I put in the time and I put in the effort and I go to that person and I say, okay, please teach me what I'm not seeing. Show me how to see this problem the way you're seeing this problem. And when I put in that effort, I find that that person, A, appreciates it. That instead of coming at them and just trying to hammer home the solution I want or to make my, or reiterate the points I've already made, right? Instead, I'm like, no, no, no. Clearly, you're looking at this differently than I am. Let me understand it. And if I can have that conversation with them, if I can have that conversation with them to a level of thoroughness where they can hear me explain it and they agree with how I explain it, that is where we have, now we've got a foundation. Now we're, now we're getting somewhere, right? So I like that idea that I'm in that interaction. I'm aiming for them to trust me to represent their position, even if they weren't in the room, that high bandwidth, high trust relationship, right? They know me, we've established a friendship, we understand each other, we have taken the time to uh, talk through this individual problem, and I have authentically brought my enthusiastic curiosity to this, in, to this conversation so I can understand why it is that we disagree. And then once I can represent their argument back to them, and they're like, yes, you've got it now. I'm like, great. So there's this one other thing that I'd like to bring to your attention, right? Because odds are, when we're looking at that problem, we're both engineers, like we, we probably already agree on like 80% of it, right? It's just that little bit on the margins. So it usually doesn't take that long to, to cover that bit on their margin. And then going back to my own side, I said, hey, all right, now, now if you don't mind, can we just talk about these things real quick? And I've seen this work out in one of two ways. I was like, oh, yeah, you're right. I didn't think about that. That's, that's a really good point, right? Which they're open to doing at that point because you've, again, you've built their trust that you are both looking at the problem or can both look at the problem from the same perspective. And then the other way that that can work out is when they tell me about their 20%, I'm like, oh yeah, I'm so glad we talked about your side, <laughs> right? Because if I had tried to tell them about my side, or if I had stayed entrenched where I was, then we would have still been butting heads, even though once I took the time to understand their position, I found out that I was the one who needed to learn something. So I think that that's excellent. And I think that three alignments is probably the most helpful thing I have learned this year in helping me operate effectively in a large organization. Um, but I can see it applied at all levels. Um, I, I certainly wish I'd had that approach in my toolkit uh, before now. Um, all right, the next point up there. Um, remember earlier, we, we talked a little bit about elitism. We talked about this idea that there's a stereotypical definition of what a you know, hardcore, really amazing software engineer should look like. I've even actually heard the term neckbeards before used to describe like the guy who really knows stuff because clearly he wants to grow a beard. I, like, I, I don't understand the correlation. I, I, it, it sounds absurd to me, but the point is that there are stereotypes um, and even sometimes our customers, right? Like the business stakeholders will have those stereotypes. But there are these stereotypes around who is an excellent engineer and who isn't an excellent engineer. And that is a culture of elitism that I believe impedes our ability to operate effectively as a team. So one of the ways I find most effective for fighting back against that kind of elitism is the, top, is the concept of courageous ignorance. All of us work in a field that is so vast and it's moving so fast that we will spend the vast majority of our career learning something new every day and still never 
know enough to be an authority on the entire breadth of our industry, right? That's why I'm an API architect, a REST API architect, right? They're not asking me to build the APIs for operating systems. No, they have tasked me with, hey, you've, you've written a lot of integrations. We'd like you to lead how our integrations get published so that others can consume them. And so we all end up specializing to some degree or another. And that inevitably means, especially when you're interoperating at like a, a senior level for sure, or when you're very new to a team, it inevitably means you're going to be in a conversation with someone and they're gonna bring up a subject. And that subject is going to be something that you have never even heard of. And because you've never heard of it, you know that it is going to be embarrassing to have to admit that to your peers. And that's why I call it courageous ignorance, that you have to be willing to take a risk so that someone can accept that risk with empathy and say, oh, well, it's this cool thing, or, oh, we can talk about that later, or I'll catch you up on that, or here's the link to the documentation on that, right? You, you by taking that risk, being the one who is courageously ignorant, you take a risk and it gives you the opportunity to understand the quality of the people you're working with. Do they respond with empathy? Do they respond with curiosity? Do they respond trying to be helpful, right? Or do they come down on you? And if they drop the hammer on you and like, oh, well, you should know that, well, clearly you now understand who the bad guy in the room really is. Because we are all going to face that imposter syndrome type feeling of, oh, I don't know anything about that topic, but I'm a software engineer, which means I'm supposed to know how to do X with that thing. And we just have to give ourselves, again, have to be compassionate with ourselves, right? Have some empathy for ourselves, give it like living your values again, giving yourself some space, Acknowledging that it's okay to not be an expert on anything, on everything, because nobody can be an expert on everything. And it's that complementary experience sets or skill sets. That's what makes a really good team. If everyone on the team had to know everything that everyone else on the team had, that would be a really, really expensive team that doesn't get a lot of stuff done because they're constantly cross-training each other. So that idea of being honest with yourself about what you're, um, weak points are, what, what you do know, what you don't know, and being willing to be honest with your peers, it creates that opportunity to build trust. And once you build trust, that's when you can start building those high bandwidth relationships, right? Where because you trust each other to have the best interest or to, to be the person represented by your values, right? To be transparent about what it is that you care about and why it is that you're in that, engaged in that conversation. That builds, the, that establishes the trust. Once you have that trust, you can then use that to communicate quickly and briefly without it being a friction point, without that causing problems and, and degrading the functioning of the team. So big fan of that particular concept. Um, next, I'd like to talk about, uh, in particular, how we package information when we're speaking to different audiences. And this is something that I'm growing on at the moment, and I'm fortunate to work with some people who are good at it and who can take the time to mentor me on it. Um, but at the business versus technical level, right, it's important, and I think most of us start to realize this, you know, at that intermediate to senior engineer range, it's like it, you have a much different outcome when you interact with a business stakeholder. If you can do that using language that is comfortable and familiar to them, instead of trying to force them into your world, instead of trying to teach them all of the things that they need to know to reach the same conclusion that you're concluding. It's, again, if that's a high trust relationship, which we'll get to that again in a minute, but again, th those establishing that trust, being willing to be vulnerable about what you don't know about their business, for example, right? Those things are opportunities and don't let them slip past you because if, it, you know, sorry, I'm back to the other point, staying on, staying on task. But when we're having that conversation with a state, with a stakeholder, in framing that conversation specifically uh, around what is their goal? What is the thing that matters to them? And how does the conversation we are currently having either help them achieve that goal or represent a risk to that goal? And can we be transparent about that now? Can we tell them about it now? I once built an accounting system and that accounting system was built under the pretext that we would, or the, the requirement that we would never do X. 
And so I was like, are you sure? Are you sure you're never gonna do X? Because it seems like X is something we really, really need to have. And they're like, no, 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 for our business model, we will never need X, skip that, let's get to market faster. I was like, okay, I can understand that. You know, having sat on a board, I can understand getting to market, that's an imperative, that's important. So we built it and about five years later, they came back and they're like, hey, uh, I need you to do X. And I was like, oh man, really? But the reality is that I had been transparent in that conversation with them five years before. So when they came back to tell me that they needed this capability, they already understood that we had specifically made design decisions that were gonna make it difficult to go back and add that because we optimized that out of the solution. So framing the problem from the audience is critical, not just when you're like trying to talk about the IT and the technology, but when you're trying to prevent future As we move on from frame the problem for the audience, I think that it's really important for us to be cognizant of the effect of pattern matching when we are communicating with other people. Um, I mean, and we've done that all the time. We'll have an engineering conversation. It's like, oh, well, it's just a factory pattern or you know, it's just a singleton, go ahead and set that up. And that means something, that very short phrase means something that quickly establishes a mental model in that other person's mind. And that is a way to make that communication efficient. So one of the things I've learned through mentoring opportunities or opportunities I've had to be a mentee is that the longer people are in an organization or in the career, the more we begin to rely on patterns and matching things against those patterns rather than trying to build an entirely new model. And I think we've all probably struggled with that at some point, right? Where we're having a conversation with someone and they keep going back to thinking about it in a given perspective. And we're like, right, but we have to make this adjustment to how we think about it. And so that we're essentially asking them to build a new mental model and add that to their catalog of patterns. So I think that the staff engineer book does a good job of bringing up how this can be an issue when you are attempting to communicate with extremely busy people, right? So if you think about a director, a senior director, um, or a chief of something in a company, that individual has a lot of decisions to make. I mean, that's essentially why they're in that role is they have established trust within the organization to consistently make what are hopefully sound decisions, but they, you know, they have a track record, they have reason to believe that their decision-making capability can be trusted. And so when that individual goes to consume information, it's not uncommon for them to have a preferred communication format, something that makes it easy for them to soak up that information and to establish that pattern match, or when necessary, build a new pattern and add it to their library. So one of the things that I call out, in, or one of the things I call out on the slide is the importance of taking the time to understand what format of information is going to be the most effective and align with the patterns that that person has for consuming information. And this is something you should be able to figure out, right? You should like either your organization has an established way that they do architecture decision records, right? Or they have an established way on how they do a status report or an OKR update. And so taking the time to find that, making sure you're conforming with it, that's one thing that can help. You can also, like if that person has an assistant, you can ask if you know people who have worked with that person in the past, you can look at some of the documents that have been successful. Um, and these are ways to utilize your engineer's attention to detail to improve communication outcomes without it being at all fake or scheming or plotting, right? Again, transparency, authenticity. We care about the outcome and because we care about the outcome, we're gonna put in a little extra effort to make sure that the individual making the decision is able to soak up the information and do so efficiently. This isn't um, something This isn't something that I have communicated easily to people in the past, right? They've, I've gotten pushback. I'm like, well, it feels two-faced or it feels duplicitous. And I'm like, what's your goal? Because that's really what you're asking when you make those questions, when you ask those questions. What is the reason that you see something in that light? And if you're doing those things to achieve some kind of personal gain, well, then maybe. 
But if you really are authentically dedicated to being an advocate for your customer, right? Whoever your stakeholder is, if you're there, I'm here to fight for you. I'm here to, here to solve your problems. Then I believe that this type of attention to detail in communication is a key way to ensure we are being respectful of the time of the money being spent on that time and hopefully helping reach a quality decision more efficiently. Um, another topic that we can move on to here is proposals and trying to get organizations aligned behind a particular solution or a particular approach to a problem. Um, the reason I bring this up is because it's something I'm learning how to do. Uh, because it's the first time I've operated in an organization this large at the current level. And so I find myself frequently trying to build consensus behind a given set of um, statements describing a problem and then consensus on which of a few options are the right one to move forward. Um, and one, I had, or one of the opportunities I had recently while working with my mentee was their request for me to help them put together a proposal for their tech lead. I was like, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to work on this skill anyway. So you remember earlier I mentioned that mentor because we want to be better and the act of mentoring helps us get there. So I want to call that out. And so the way I went about it was like, all right, well, I think generally we need to use this series of documents as templates. So we went, I went and helped them find other proposals and we said, all right, well, here are the things that seem to be common about these. Let's go ahead and we set up a page around that same framework and you know i gave some general outlines of like the things i thought needed to be covered in each of them and then they ran off and like did their own like first draft of it and knowing that this was not my strong suit the first thing i did was reach out to one of our product managers who i have a great deal of respect for and i said hey look this thing and could you take a look and like maybe help us and he was like oh yeah no problem so um we set that up for a little bit farther out on the calendar and my mentee came back and so it's the next week and we're meeting and I'm like, all right, let's look at this. I'm like, all right, well, probably want some data points on this. And I think we could probably do a, a quick query to, to understand how many tickets are being created because of this factor. And so as we went through that process, I helped them optimize for brevity, right? Because that's one of the things that I've been trying to pass on to them is that idea that exposition is often less helpful than we think it is, right? And so helping them like pare down the language, avoid the metaphor, the simile. So a lot of the things on this deck, it was an opportunity for me to practice those things and in practicing them, pass those on because it's much easier to transfer that type of uh, value or that type of approach to your profession when someone can see you living it than if you just tell them to do it, right? Um, so the end of the story was, uh, I then I'm like, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm going to impress my, 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 my product management friend. I am going to bring him this and he's going to say, this is great. It's got everything. <laughs> and we get on the zoom call and he's like, all right, okay. So what did you mean by this? And like, and immediately it starts to fall apart. And I'm just, I'm just laughing at myself. Right. Cause I had this idea walking in, but practicing these principles I've been talking about has taught me humility, right? If I get up every day and I'm like, I'm going to go try and live all these things and I manage to get six out of eight relatively well represented that day, that's a win, right? So that idea of like walking into that and then laughing at the mistakes I made and he taught me something super useful real quick one, right? That if you're going to use a percentage, make sure you give a percentage of some other quantity. Maybe that other quantity is a number, maybe it's a description, but the point is that you can't walk in and say it's a problem 70% of the time without also saying, and we get three requests a month. Okay, well, in that case, right, you've got a really bad failure rate. That's a huge deal. But if that's of an issue, you know, like for a critical, critical integration, right, maybe you only get the data update from the manufacturer three times a month. If it's failing that often, that's huge. Um, but if instead you're saying it's a 3% failure out of 300 million requests per month, okay, that's an issue, but it's not a world shattering issue, right? That's, that might not be a P1 issue. So I thought that was a really useful piece of feedback from my PM friend, and it's something I'm doing now in all of my documents. And if you come up with good ones, by all means, please share them with me via LinkedIn. You can find me there.
So uh, moving on, are there any questions about the communication section of the deck? All right, chat. Now's your chance. Last time. Oh, there's one more. There's one more. Okay. Actually, there's, actually, there's two more. We've had some delays because of the technical problems. All right, I'll move on. All right, chat's empty. Let's uh, move on. All right, so we've got uh, two more slides or two more sections. Um, business first. This is one that took me a very long time to learn. I started off as a hobbyist, uh, someone who was just passionate about technology for technology's sake. And there was a time in my life where you would have sworn my only goal was to build what I wanted. And the fact that you were paying for it was an uncomfortable fact of life. <laughs> and there's definitely an over-architected solution in my early past, right? And maybe not my so distant past. I, I've gotten better at this over time, um, mainly through the, the biggest improvement came through the experience of being on the board of a small company for 10 years. And I mentioned earlier about the challenges with um, getting a product to market in the right window of time where it can have a meaningful impact on the course of the business. So that time to market problem and that window of opportunity problem, when I was having those conversations on that board, it changed the way that I thought about my daily activities because I was also the senior architect for that company. And so when I was giving advice to my engineers that were, were implementing features, I was like, all right, maybe we don't need to do that, but we definitely need to do this, right? And that idea of working on behalf of the client, which was easy for me because I was a stakeholder in that company, right? I was on the board, I had, you know, had an ownership stake, but that idea of being a zealous advocate for your client, have you heard that before? Because if so, it might have been a lawyer who said it, right? That like when you go and you establish a relationship with a lawyer, that lawyer has a set of ethical standards that are implied through that contract. And they, and they often get spelled out. But the idea there is you're hiring that specialist so that they can be a zealous advocate on your behalf. And I believe that we, as software engineers, as problem solvers, as the makers and the doers that bring businesses to reality and allow them to like function and, and move forward and evolve in today's world, I feel like we can adopt that same mindset, right? So that zealous advocate for your business stakeholder is, is really the theme behind this slide. Um, and as part of that, there are two more books I'm calling out here, Team Topologies and The Manager's Path. I think that those are both good. Um, Team Topologies is particularly interesting from an engineering perspective. And I think The Manager's Path is great for an engineer to read so that they can understand more of the perspective of the people who are leading their teams. Um, but back to the concept of business first, right? Which I think those books will help you with. Um, Adopt the mental model of those who came before. You heard me say earlier, we work in engineering. There are very few irrational engineers, right? Because things tend not to work if we can't get them to stand up and function. Um, so this idea of adopt the mental model of those who came before, this came from a project that I worked on where I met every requirement uh, to rebuild the software and to deliver the software to the, to the customer. And when I did this, and I delivered the software, I was like, ta-da! And they were like, this is nothing like what we wanted. And like, they had been in the iterative meetings. This was an agile project, right? Um, because up to that point in time, the iterative meetings had been with the owner of the company and with the, 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 the deciders and the head of IT and everything in the company. But when they took it and gave it to their actual people in the field, those people in the field were not familiar with it. And even though you could go through and map like feature to feature from the old system to the new system, because it didn't fit the pattern that they were used to, it wasn't comfortable for them. And that product ended up not being adopted by the company. That the, the people in the field were so resistant to the alternative approach I had taken with the user interface architecture that, you know, to me felt like a very standard, natural, normal UI. Um, and an improvement over where they were, you know, and which their own management 
endorsed and approved and said, yes, we like it. When they finally took it to market to their, their people to use it, they rejected it. And it's interesting to me because I remember the early phases of that project where I'm looking at the source code for the existing code base. And unquestionably, it was one of the least well-structured. Uh, it was, you know, we have the concept dry. It was the wettest code base I had ever seen. Um, so there were a lot of challenges with that code base. And I knew that the person who had implemented that code base had essentially learned to be a software developer while building that software. And I'm like, okay, well, I did that in high school and I remember how good that code was. So I had a little bit of empathy for it, but I started off from this prospect or this perspective of saying, as we start down this process, clearly we should rewrite because this software does not have any test coverage at all. And it's just, it's, it's a mess. And I don't know how I would even begin. And as I got to the end of that project and I saw that product fail after over a million dollars was spent developing, it, I thought back and I said, you know, the best documentation we have of business requirements is the code that's in production. And the best documentation we have around what will make the business work and work well is the software interface that is in production. And it was a learning point for me to say, when I encounter something and I look at it and my engineer's re gut reflex is to like, oh, it's a cringe factor solution. I have to set that aside. I need to be courageous about that and say, okay, this doesn't look like, the, like I would want it to look. Let me find some curiosity and figure out why. And sometimes it will be that case I just cited where someone was figuring it out as they went along and that's painful, right? And it's painful to inherit that solution. But the pain of inheriting that solution is significantly smaller than the risk of trying to re-implement that solution. And so I came up with this maxim, and you've noticed there's a, a lot of them in this deck where it's me trying to compress an idea down into the smallest possible number of words. But adopt the mental model of those who came before is this idea that the company is functional, right? It's not like they're out of business. They're hiring you to do some work. And the system that's there may be ugly, may be uncomfortable, but if you peel back the layers and you learn its history, if you do the archaeology on that solution, it's not uncommon to find that it got to where it was through very legitimate and rational means. In fact, there's a technical problem that I deal with that is one of those uncomfortable, unpleasant problems. But I straight up said when I was onboarding and I was first introduced to it and they were like, this is an issue and this is why it's an issue. And I was like, huh, I, would admit, I, I can totally see how I, in the position of the people who made this who came, who came to this conclusion, would have gotten to the same outcome because I used to build intranet web applications and I had the mindset that they had, and I can totally understand how they got from A to B to C to D. And even though D really hurts and makes my day to day a little challenging now or a lot challenging now, I understand that blaming those people is not helpful. Looking down on those people is not helpful. The best thing I can do is take the time to learn that perspective as to how we got there so I can build an accurate model of the system, take over its stewardship, and iteratively improve it to a better place. So that's a lot, but that's all for that first bullet point. Um, but it does touch a little bit on this idea of rally around business requirements. So you heard me say as I was introducing this slide, adopt, like, adopt that idea that the lawyers have right? A zealous advocate for your client, that you're not emotionally invested in whether the solution that is there is nice or not nice, easy or not easy. You're not um, representing an agenda of what your technical biases are. No, you're coming in, you're saying, look, I'm a maker and a problem solver. Tell me what the problems are. I'm going to advocate for you. And I'm going to go to the mat to figure out what is needed to make this technical solution evolve and work in the way you need it to work. So that is one of those things we talked about earlier, right? Establishing trust so that you can manage, uh, so that you can manage to get to where you have that high bandwidth relationship, where you can be 
efficient and effective. And you can have a team that flows like a well-oiled machine, but that takes time. It takes investing up front. And one of the things we need to invest in, especially with stakeholders, is transparency, making sure they understand that we are really and truly committed, authentically committed to seeing them be successful because it should matter to us, right? That's, that's something that should be important to us. I mean, if we're working in an industry where we don't care about the outcomes, it's unlikely we are performing to our best capacity. And it's likely that if we're in that situation, everyone would be better served if we found somewhere that did challenge us and did inspire us and did have us performing at our peak, right? I know that the, the company I spoke of earlier, I, I think I stayed there too long. I stayed there past the point where I was challenged and past the point where I was inspired and engaged. And my performance fell off precipitously around that time. And I know this because I have the journal, right? And I can go back and I can look and I can say, yeah, you know, between 2019, 2020, 2021, I was not, I was not doing as much. I was not as committed, right? And it shows. So I feel like this is a, a really important point, like rallying around the business, around the requirements, seeing them as a challenge and an opportunity. And man, let's, let's go build a fort, right? I don't know what your why is, but that one is mine. It doesn't have to be a mansion. It can just be a shoddy little fort in a tree, but it's fun to build it anyway. It's that dicing up the problem, coming together, contributing to the solution. That's exciting. And that's the next point on the slide, right? Enthusiasm is infectious. You guys heard me make mention earlier of the dangers of cynicism and sarcasm, where sarcasm is the like gateway drug to cynicism. And I try as best as I'm able, being a person who in my personal life is exceptionally sarcastic in my sense of humor. But in my professional life, I try very hard to ensure my sense of humor does not convey anything in that anywhere near that end of the spectrum. Because we have a hard enough job as it is without us sitting around talking about why it's difficult or making fun of it. And maybe we do that over beers at the bar. But if I'm in a meeting, I don't want to laugh at our problems, even if it is a funny joke. And I know this sounds so weird and so out there, but I honestly believe that when we represent enthusiasm and curiosity transparency, authenticity, empathy, when we come into that problem and we're like, look, I am here as a zealous advocate to get something done and I'm going to be enthusiastic about getting it done. That is what's going to help that team get to that gelled state, right? Because enthusiasm is infectious. And unfortunately, it's not as infectious as cynicism, right? Cynicism is much, spreads much easier. And so I feel it's incumbent on us to bring that enthusiasm and to be the bulwark for why the team does want to come together, for why we are inspired and why we are going to take on this problem and take on this challenge. And even though it is going to be hard, we're going to have the resilience to see it through. Next is um, another point, compromise is required. Um, and if a solution does not include uncomfortable compromises, then I think you need to really ask yourself whether or not it got to market as quickly as it could have. If the ROI on that solution was as high as it could be. Because the biggest thing I have learned in my career is that over-optimizing a solution is the quickest way for a project to fail. And you heard me talk about the project that failed that was a million dollar spend, right? And you know, that project failed for a, a couple of factors around like how the UI was perceived and stuff like that. But you know, I think that I could have gotten that project done faster if I had been more willing to do this thing. And the reason I know that is because I went on to that next organization that I referenced where I was a stakeholder. And at that organization, I regularly worked with one of the most painful code bases. Not as painful as the one I'm from before, but it was one of the most painful code bases I'd ever been in. Um, and to the extent that the, the framework had hard-coded exits in it. So like if you tried to put a, a, a test case around it, you had to rewrite, rewrite the framework first. I mean, this was, this was a trying place to be. Yet that solution was in production and it was making money. And the best documentation we had of the requirements was the code that was in production. So 
we had to adopt it, we had to love it, and we had to iterate it to something better. And it took time, right? We we invested in getting code coverage on it, which meant we invested in understanding the framework it was built on, which had been abandoned, and then re rewriting that framework as needed so that we could put the tests in place, so that we could begin making changes with confidence, so that we could take it to a better place. And I maintained that code base for 10, almost 10 years. And I when I got it, it was a mess. And when I left it, it was not nearly the mess that it was, right? And so I take pride in that fact that I was able to, even though this solution represented a whole basket of compromises that I never would have agreed to. I mean, like data access from the web controller, like going running direct SQL statements from the web controller. That's the kind of thing that I put a hard line on in any software that I'm building from scratch that I designed. But I adopted this ugly baby and I said, all right, we can fix this, right? And it was that idea of fixing it slowly across that time that gave me the opportunity to really see the difference in that ownership mindset, right? The difference in that focus on saying, I recognize that this is not ideal, but the fact that it's not ideal is not going to impede my enthusiasm for being the best professional I could be, for being the best advocate for my customer that I can be. Um, you heard me mention earlier about building accounting system explicitly leaving out X. I had already talked there about surfacing trade-offs and agreeing on risks. I feel it's super important point, um, but I, we've already covered it. So I'll move on to prioritize user experience and as API architect, developer experience, because uh, the two are synonymous or not synonymous, but they are equivalent impact in their domains. And that is, again, that application I told you about before, the most recently, the one that had that really painful code base. And when I was working on that one, the biggest risk I saw to it was that the user interface was too brittle. Um, that if we made changes, they, they, they had too many side effects. And so we were stuck in the same user experience for far longer than we should have been, uh, especially anyone who's been using the more modern, like data-driven UI refinement techniques. None of those were an option to us because we couldn't go in and just try things out. Um, we couldn't do split testing on the UI and stuff like that due to the way it was implemented. And in hindsight, if there was a, the biggest risk factor to that organization was the user interface. And while I did call that out not long after I got there, um, I got tuned out that I wasn't communicating it effectively, right? That optimized for brevity thing and understanding the stakes that the people that you're talking to have in the outcome. And so for me, as someone who came into that solution, I'm like, I know this is a problem, but I can't get them to listen to me about it. Over time, I got frustrated by that. And that frustration built up. And I kept trying to come at it fresh, trying to you know, bring the enthusiasm, but soon, eventually it did overcome me. And that's where I, I mentioned earlier in like 2019, I, I was no longer invested and I wasn't being my best self for that organization anymore. And that I think is something we need to be keenly aware of, right? We need to understand when we are not bringing our best. And I think that journaling habit helps with that, helps us understand how often we're making mistakes or how often we're having to go back and do things again, or why did I spend four hours on that? I should have been able to do it in two. Those types of reflective moments are an opportunity for us to say, like, is this the right place for me? Would I be growing faster if I were more challenged? Or would I be more engaged if I were working in a different domain? And I think it's important for us to be focused on that, to take those opportunities and like the mouse comment earlier, prioritize the user experience. Fill the die on. Any questions? Uh, yes, but I think we should skip them just for the sake um, of time. All right, I apologize. Uh, all right, so on to the next topic, leadership. And this is one where I've been doing the most growing this year. And I will jump right in since we are running behind on time. When it comes to leadership, I've heard different descriptions of how to lead. Um, uh, like one that I've heard is servant leadership, for example. The one I like most is the one that I've started telling the people I work with um, is lead with empathy. And I don't mean just to be a leader who has the capacity for empathy. I mean that if I'm walking into a conversation with someone, I need to exercise empathy to understand the context of that conversation like what are the concerns the considerations are they feel are they dealing with a p1 right now and this conversation is a distraction from what they need to do 
that's empathy, right? That's just taking a moment to check in and say, hey, can you spare the time, right? Like that's a great way to start a conversation. Can you spare the time to talk about X now or should we do it later? Um, so that's one version of it. And the other is, uh, was part of what we mentioned earlier when I was talking about sponsorship, right? Where we don't want to make assumptions around someone's career path. We want to take the time to ask them. We want to take the time to understand what their goals are. So leading with empathy is that idea that I'm going to walk into each interaction with a, a conscious intention to take a moment and understand the scope that that person is currently sitting in before I start asking them questions, before I start, you know, making uh, requests of them, right? So that's an important point that I can't stress enough as far as the efficacy we've seen from that in our team. Um, I've never worked on a team that is so tr so high trust, right? And I, I talked about that earlier, like um, courageous ignorance, man, we are good at that on this team. And the level of trust we have on that team, we can talk about anything and we can cover ground really fast. And man, we've been nailing and closing those sprints because no one on the team has any resistance whatsoever to saying, hey, I don't get it. Could you spare a minute to look at this with me, right? And so that level of trust is just incredibly valuable. And it makes the, the team is just really gelled together so well, um, which by the way, uh, if, if that concept is unfamiliar, uh, maybe take the time to look up the five phases of a team. It's a, it's a good concept to be familiar with. Um, so moving next uh, to curiosity in the face of adversity. Um, I mentioned this earlier as one of the things I try to relay to mentees when I'm like, when they're first coming up, because they end up facing a lot of adversity very early on because everything is unfamiliar, everything's new. And I got to do a Google query to figure out how to start my Windows or my browser or whatever. <laughs> it feels that way at that point. So facing that curiosity with empathy at the other end of the spectrum is even more important because I will regularly find myself in a situation where I am trying to lead a change in the organization. Maybe it's a small change, maybe it's a big change. But inevitably, there are reasons why that change hasn't been completed already. There's a reason it wasn't already the case. And so I will face some amount of friction or adversity or even just priority competition where I'm like, hey, this is important. And someone's like, yeah, well, this is important too, right? So that idea that I'm still at 41 after you know doing this, I started, I wrote my first pro, wrote Hello World in 1997, right? That like, I, even after doing it for this long, I'm still running into that friction. I'm still running into these things where I, I can't make progress in the direction I want to. And I have to fall back on that idea of enthusiastic curiosity, right? Like, okay, cool. Your priority, let's talk about that. Can I understand that, right? Let me, let me align with you. Let me figure out, because we can go back to that three alignments problem. Um, the next I want to bring up is be a bridge or be the bridge. Another way to say this is to be a router. Um, I find that the efficacy of my team is significantly enhanced when I have taken the time to reach out across the organization and establish connections with all of my peers or as many of my peers as I reasonably can. I mean, there's a, there's a limited number of staff plus individuals, but my ability to know who to talk to about a given problem is really helpful for my team because in a very large organization, you know, there's no way that that staff engineer in that other vertical can know every engineer in the company, just like I can't know every engineer in the company from where I'm at. So the fact that I know them and my engineer can ask me and I can ask them and they can say, talk to this engineer, then we can connect the two of them. That's hugely effective, right? So that idea of like understanding the topology of the teams and understanding the topology of the solution so you can put the two together to say, all right, I know who to talk to about any given, any given time, hugely effective. And another reason to authentically invest in building meaningful relationships with your peers. Um, radical ownership is this idea that I was accused of, <laughs> complimentary. Um, I, uh, I, I resolved an issue. Um, at one of my employers. And when I did, the way in which I did it uh, impressed my manager. And my manager came to me and said, you know, I feel like that way you do things, that radical ownership concept, I feel like that that's really valuable. And I want to just call out and, and, and let you know that I appreciate it. So I stopped. And when I went to journal that, I said, well, what, what, is, what did I do that he was talking about? 
And when I sat down and I processed through it and I'm like, all right, how would I try and explain this back to myself since I didn't have a mentee there to do it? Um, I worked through it and I, the realization I came to was I've spent a lot of time in small startup minded organizations. And in those organizations, if you see a problem, odds are you're the only person who has who can who can deal with that problem, right? Um, those organizations are always overwhelmed with requests and very rarely have the, any excess capacity. So, or even the ability to deprioritize the hottest fires of the moment, that whole like build the plane on the way off the cliff type idea. So because I had spent time in that and because I had had an equity stake in the company involved, that left me in this frame of mind where I'm like, if there's a problem that is impeding an opportunity, I'm going to jump on that problem or I'm going to own that problem at least long enough to find it a home. And as I thought it through some more, I realized, OK, so this isn't just something I was doing then. It was something I was doing in my personal life before that, where I adopted this mindset of saying that, you know what, this space right here, I'm accountable for. That if it happens within this space, I have the opportunity to influence it. And because I have the opportunity to influence it, I'm accountable for either choosing to or choosing not to. And so that started much earlier in my life. And that actually started again because of my value for the stoic philosophy. And you'll see Ego is the Enemy up there, which is unquestionably one of the most significant books I have read for personal improvement. Um, and the, oh, and Quiet. That the Quiet is an incredibly effective book for conveying the power of in, like the power of listening as a leadership trait. I think that Susan Cain makes an incredibly compelling case for why the type of people you often see in a leadership role, people who are extroverted, um, people who are you know outspoken and you know very decisive, that kind of conform to that warrior archetype from like our tribal past, that those individuals are commonly found in leadership roles. But when you look at performance data, it seems that quiet leaders, that when you take someone who is a listener uh, more than they are a, a talker and you put them in that leadership role, the data seems to show more effective teams resulting in more effective outcomes because leadership is predominantly about understanding the people who you are asking to help you achieve a goal. So if you haven't read Quiet, I highly recommend it. Also, the staff engineer book is phenomenal. I would not be able to function the way I am able to function now if it hadn't been for the many lessons that I picked up from that book. Um, so going back to that idea of radical ownership, right? This is this space I am accountable for. When I see something at work that is a risk, it's a problem, it's a threat, and no one is currently owning that item, I stop thinking to myself, you know what? I'm, I am a zealous advocate for my client. Relativity's problems are my personal problems. I take ownership of every problem. The only difference between those problems is whether relativity already has a really great person working on that problem, right? So I don't need to take ownership of the things going on at the customer service desk, but man, if there was a customer service issue that came up and I was the only one there and there wasn't a way to route that to the appropriate people, I'm on it. I will own that problem, right? And at least to the extent that I will own the problem long enough to find it the appropriate home. And so when I demonstrated that mindset in this organization and it got called out to me, that, hey, this is, that, that was exceptional or that was very useful or that's a, that was a really great thing. And I was like, okay, well, interesting. I'm not, I wasn't cognizant that that's what I was doing. So back to the journal, back to that practice of reflection, right? That's, again, everything in this deck is just an implementation detail for a set of principles. And I fully expect this deck to expand over time as I find new and inter interesting ways to apply those principles. And radical ownership, I think, is a, a really important one that I suspect will endure uh, for as long as this deck exists. And the last point I have to make um, on the subject of leadership is to celebrate others. And I feel that in our retro for our sprint, um, we have a section specifically for kudos where that high trust team I talked about, and this is one of the activities that has helped build that high trust. But we find the time, and it's maybe two, three minutes, but we find the time to just pause and reflect on that sprint and say, hey, you know what? I was more successful because you did X, or I appreciate you doing this other thing. And that transparency 
again, reinforces that high trust, high bandwidth relationship. And those are so, so effective at solving problems that I, I feel that that idea of celebrating others is a key component. And if your retro does not already include that, I suggest you add that to your start, stop, keep, right? Let's, let's add that. And it does require a little bit of vulnerability, a little bit of courage um, to be the one who steps up and says, hey, I appreciate that you did that. Um, because that implies a certain amount of like, I wasn't doing it already, or maybe I needed help. Oh, forbid. But still, that idea of like saying thank you, that helps build those relationships. And the other aspect of Celebrate Others, I'm going to tie back to the sponsorship slide. Um, that one of the things I look for is an opportunity to bring up the names of people I think are really awesome. Like I mentioned that I, I reached out to all those recruiters, right, for that person. I'm like, this person's exceptional. And I felt like I could authentically and transparently celebrate that individual and what they were doing and that they were already achieving above their no internship status. They need an internship, man. They've clearly earned it. They're ready. Um, and so that idea of celebrating others also factors back into that. And I think it aligns really well with those values. And especially that idea of um, from Ryan Holiday's book, the, the ego is the enemy concept, where in order to kind of authentically celebrate others, you, you, you have to step aside. You have to say that this isn't about me, right? Um, you know, like the, I like to think of it in terms of the all, any, any problem that a, a person who reports to me might have been involved in is a problem that I will deal with. Like that will, that will stop here, right? When the friction comes down from on high, it will stop here. I'm never going to surface that friction back down to them, but any success, any good things, well, then I'm a valve. And I'm going to let that flow right past because I want all of those good things to reflect on them. And the reason they have someone like me in a leadership role is because they should be able to trust me to do that, right? They should be able to trust me to be confident that I know what I'm doing and that I am able to go to that business stakeholder and communicate that, hey, look, this is what went wrong. This is how we're not going to let it happen again. The buck stops with me and I will work with my team to ensure you don't have that problem again. Right. They should be able to trust me to do that, not to like throw them under the bus. So that's a I'm going to leave that point there as the last one I make on the subject, because I feel that that's an extremely important one. Considering where we are on time, I'm going to skip the questions and I'm going to go right to the recap. You guys saw me open up with a slide called Agenda that had these principles on it. And here we are at the end of this presentation. And I am bringing up that same slide again, but I believe with a more accurate title, a personal agenda. The things that you feel are important to you, your why gives you your motivation. Mentoring is a way to maintain your momentum in how you evolve and improve yourself because you can't teach without first having to go back and retouch on your understanding. That idea of courageous ignorance, right? A, a curiosity in the face of adversity, using your motivation to cultivate enthusiasm and to hopefully turn away from or at least mitigate the amount of cynicism or sarcasm in a, in a professional environment. The practice of reflection, that's what's going to help you improve, iterate and try again. And I use a professional journal to make that happen but maybe you will be the person to come up with some other creative way, some other practice that is your reflection method that helps you make that progress. Empathy, lead with empathy. Empathy is the path to the, is, is, is the biggest requirement, the biggest ingredient that you need when you're trying to get to that high bandwidth, high trust relationship. And transparency is gonna help you get there. People need to know what your motivations are, why you're invested, and why you care. And being transparent about that and being transparent about the good things and the bad things, like, hey, I can make that change for you, but I'm going to have to cut this corner. It's going to have this consequence, like I talked about with that accounting system. Transparency will work in your favor. Resilience. These are hard values. IT is hard. Lots of things in life are hard. And it is much, much easier to have that negative voice in your mind to say, oh, I'll never be good at that. 
or to, to, to allow that to just keep you from trying or for you to feel embarrassed even with yourself because, oh, I could have done better. I should have done better. Well, okay, fine, but let's redirect that. How do I take that embarrassment? How do I turn that into a motivation to get up and try again? A, a wonderful line from that resilience book is that the elite carry only what they need and we don't need shame. And we don't need self-consciousness, right? We don't need these things that are holding us back. And we want to be elite operators in the world of IT. So we need to focus on the things that add value. And we need to be willing to try and try again, even when we fail. And the most important principle, that's why it's the first one up there, though I wouldn't say that they're ranked. But the reason it's the first one up there is because authenticity is the mortar that lets anything happen along this path to that high trust, high bandwidth relationship. That you have to be authentic. People have to believe not just that you're representing yourself, but that you actually mean what you are saying, that you are invested in. And the only path I know to establish that or to make that transparency clear is to be as willing to own your mistakes as you are your successes and to be willing to be vulnerable. Again, back to that courageous ignorance, right? So in conclusion, we are left with one recipe for a continuously improving professional. Adopt a set of guiding principles, courageously personify them, journal and reflect on the outcomes, and iterate the implementation. I've shared what that process has yielded for me, and I know that the iteration will continue, that this will improve over time, um, but I hope that those of you who are able to attend the talk are able to take some of this home with you in, in small bites with patience and self and self care, begin to iterate on your own journey. And hopefully you will be able to teach me some things. All right. Thank you, Adam, so much. If anyone wants to get in touch, that's the QR code for my LinkedIn profile. Um, you can find me there. Also, right. I will be posting the slide deck and some additional resources uh, with it to that uh, page. And we'll make sure we get this video edited up, uh, take out the couple of little hiccups, and we'll have that posted for you, Adam, so so you can reshare with folks on LinkedIn or whatever platform you want. I appreciate um, that. That was, yeah. yeah. You don't need to cover that. that. It was a slide I ended up not using. It, oh. was a, it just showed a, break, a breakdown of my progression. Uh, time spent on IT and how that time was allocated and how it changed over time. But the deck was thick enough as it was. <laughs> so that was, I just shoved it to the end. No worries. Well, all right, everyone. Well, we're going to cut it off here. We appreciate each and every one of you hanging out with us tonight. Uh, we'll be back in December. We're taking November off, but we'll see y'all in December with our actual first hybrid meeting in three years, two years. It's been a while. So um, we're looking forward to that. We'll see you all then. Adam, thank you again so much for hanging out with us. Yeah, this was Drew, great. Thank you for hanging out. Thank you. For anyone, great talk. If you had a question you didn't get December. answered, go ahead and send it to me on LinkedIn. I'll be more than happy to talk about it there. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, we'll make sure all Adam's contact information is in the replay. All right. You guys have a great day. All right. Thanks, everyone.